Oh, Sorry. okay. Thank y'all. There, there we go. Thanking them. They didn't even hear me thanking them. Where's the fire gone? Let me pray. Jesus, thank you that we got a place to come. Lord, I thank you for air conditioning. A little warm. Ask you, Lord, that uh, you take that which is in my heart and, and help me verbalize it. Lord, let me articulate to your people what all this entails. Bless them and keep them safe for the rest of the week. We love you, Lord, in Jesus' name, amen. amen. Okay. Well, this sermon or teaching or whatever you want to call it actually was brought about by last Sunday. I saw the young adults on fire and that caused me to go back when I first got saved and I was on fire I mean I was lit up I was out of control all I did was study the word eat sleep study the word study 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 went to home groups probably two or three times a week. And the, and the fire was there, Dwayne, for a long time. And looking back, um, one of the things that did not help the fire stay fanned was when I went to seminary. There I learned all about the law, sweet Jesus. I no longer call it seminary, as you know. I call it cemetery because if you believe what they teach you, that's where you're going to end up is in your spiritual cemetery. So I asked the Lord, Lord, I mean, I've always served him, always shared, um, but I noticed that I wasn't the fire wasn't as hot as what it used to be. And then Sunday came, and golly, you know, the young adults, for sure, if, if you want to know what on fire is like, just kind of get up with one of them and, and visit with them. Matter of fact, I actually came down for prayer and asked three young men if they would pray over me concerning my lack of fire. Now, when I'm talking about fire, guys, I, um, I presume most of you have a Baptist background. Thank you, Jesus, for the Baptist church. I don't have a Baptist background. I have a Pentecostal background. So I don't want y'all to interpret fire meaning that which causes us to jump the pews or to run up and down the aisles, right? Or, or act crazy. Although I have seen that. If you go to any kind of a Pentecostal church, you're going to see something a little unusual, shall we say. But what you got to do is watch what the Lord's doing or what you perceive him doing and then go to the word of God and see if you can find it. If you can't find it, there's a possibility that the flesh got involved there. Because I'll be honest, I've never felt like running around the church. I've never been physically endowed enough to jump any pews without hurting myself. I've never saw a pew and thought, well, praise God, I'm going to jump it. <laughs> never have. Nor have I ever thought, 
Well, praise God, I'm going to run around the sanctuary three times. Of course, as you get older, you may run, but it's back to the bathroom. <laughs> You've had too much coffee and you got to get, okay. The scripture, I was told the scripture would be up there, bless their hearts. Second Timothy 1, 6 through 7. Now it's kind of, oh, there you see. When they came and asked me for the scripture, guys, that's like, you know, asking me, what's, what does the Bible say? Uh, because normally I don't have a particular scripture. I've got multiple scriptures, and I don't put it up on the screen because, well, I don't want you to be any more confused than I am when it comes to all these scriptures. So I zeroed it down to one, okay? And this is what it says. Starting in 6, for this reason, this is Paul writing Timothy, for this reason I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of hands. For God gave us a spirit, not of fear, but of power, love, and self-control. I want to talk to you tonight about fanning that flame and what that's like, what that looks like. Okay, I mean, we have these scriptures that... Um, some, sometimes you, you read it and you, you go, well, okay, how do you do that? How do you fan the flame? Well, we're going to look at that. As I studied this, there's another scripture that is is interpreted in the same manner in the same vein and and that's over in matthew where the parables about going and buying more oil it's the 10 version uh, 10 virgin story do y'all remember that story if you don't that's okay look it up when you get home so you know what i'm talking about it's a it's a refilling of the infilling So, let me get very specific so that you have an understanding of this fanning the flame. You know, how many have been out camping at some time in your life? Oh, 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 all right, great. Um, I presume that you raised your hands because I'm standing in light and y'all are all in the dark. So I'm assuming that you're responding to me. Lee, well, thank you. Lee's going to turn on a ladder too. There we go. Oh, there he is. Okay. Glory to God. Okay. Whoa. Oh, there. Thank you. Thank you. Lee's on that thing for me. So what the Lord did with me I needed things to be simple. I'll be honest, Sunday kind of wore me out in a good way, in a good way. But sometimes when you get excited, uh, if, if you're younger, you, you, you can kind of sustain that. But as you get older, you're, you're not able to sustain it as, as long as what you used to. So I needed the Lord to kind of help me take what is in the spiritual realm and bring it over into the physical realm so that we might have an understanding of how it applies. So the first thing, if you're going to build a fire out camping or if you're building a fire to cook with or whatever the case may be, the first thing that you have to have is the fuel. You got to have the wood. You got to have, you have to have the fuel. And what the fuel is in the spirit and for us is, is the word of God. If you want to get your flame, if you want to get those embers that have kind of died down, because they'll die down, how you get them fanned up again, how you get that ember to come into a flame again is that you start with the fuel, and that's the Word of God. 
You start reading the Word of God. You know, when I first got saved, Brother Steve, I was in the Word of God, brother. I mean, I couldn't help it. Uh, and and it, it says that God's an all-consuming fire. I like that term. You say, well, what does the fire consume? Well, when you first get saved, you experience that all-consuming fire because it begins to burn away the world, burn away the world's influence, burn away the religious junk that's kept you out of church. That's what that consuming fire is. But here's the neat thing is that God's so good that he gives us illustrations of fire that didn't destroy. Moses saw the burning bush, right? And the bush didn't burn up, but there was a fire there, and that got his attention. So this all-consuming fire is not designed to burn us up. It is to burn away all the underbrush, burn away all the stuff that entangles us in getting excited about the Lord. See, we're, we're, we're always, no, no, I shouldn't say that. I was always taught never say always because it's not always. There are variants, so it's not always. But let me say this. As I begin to look back on what happened to my fire, why did it dwindle? Why, why did it burn down to red-hot coals now? Don't, don't get me wrong. My love for the Lord and my desire to preach never wavered, but I wasn't as on fire as what I remember in the beginning. So I said, Lord, what is it that caused that fire to burn down into red-hot embers? Well, it's real simple. The law that we're supposed to be free from. He came and fulfilled the law, didn't he? Say yes. No, okay, that was the weakest yes I've ever heard in my entire life. He came to fulfill the law, right? Yes, yes. beautiful. But in fulfilling that, that's, that, that was the point. He fulfilled it so it shouldn't even have that kind of an influence on us, but it does. And sadly enough, depending upon the church that you attend, they got rules and they got regulations that you've got to conform to. And a lot of times those rules and regulations have nothing at all to do with the kingdom of God. It has more to do with if you want to be part of them, then you, you've got to be the way they are. The first indication uh, that I always kind of use as a measuring stick as, as to whether I wanted to attend and be part of a church was the, the first question that I had to ask was, what color is your carpet? Because I knew that at some point in time, Pastor Dwayne, the color of the carpet was going to become a point of friction. So I looked and looked and looked and, man, I, you know, I couldn't find anywhere where he told me what the color of the carpet was in the temple. So I finally gave up and thought, well, maybe that's something that the Lord left to us to decide on our own. And then I discovered that can't possibly be correct because I've seen more churches fight over the color of the carpet or the color of the pews or whatever. I just, they didn't teach me that in cemetery or to know what color the carpet was or should be or the paint on the outside of the building or the name. I'm fascinated by the names there's the First Baptist Church, and then there's the Second Baptist Church. And then, and I'm picking on Baptist prim primarily because I married a Baptist girl. And uh, bless her heart, when she married me, she didn't know I was Pentecostal. She, she did not know that I loved to preach. Back in those days, I was riding a Harley, had a ponytail, but that didn't stop me from doing all those other things, see? Well... When I first met her, our first date is a blind date. And when I saw her walk in, I thought, Jesus, you've sent me a 
Sunday school teacher? <laughs> I said, Jesus. I mean, I, 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 I know that I need a mate, but really? I mean, couldn't you at least come up with a Pentecostal gal, you know, one of those that wears the dress all the way to the floor, got the hair back up here in the bun? Well, that wasn't her. I don't know when it was that she discovered that, uh, well, I, I reckon the first clue was when I was singing in the spirit in the shower. She figured out that doesn't sound like a Baptist hymn I've heard. So, you know, she came in and kind of questioned me about what was going on. Anyway, the fuel for the fire is God's word. Romans 10, 17. So then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Do you realize that your faith is built? Every time you read the word of God, your faith is being built. Every time. I don't care if you read a paragraph or the whole book or a whole chapter. It's building your faith. How does that work? I'm not sure, but it does. It builds your faith. So if you begin to feel like the fire is not as hot as it used to be, I'd almost bet you odds that you're not in the Word the way you used to be in the Word because we've become a little lazy, a little complacent. And let's face it, the world challenges you at every point. A matter of fact, I would say that with me and probably with most of you, after you got saved, the world's influence had less to do with the fire beginning to dwindle than all the rules and regulations and modifications and all that stuff that the church puts on you. So anyway, let's continue. To start the fire, you gotta have a heat source. And what that heat source is may kind of surprise you. But it's God's love. Guys, without love and compassion, you're not going to be able to fulfill your call. It's just not going to work. <coughs> Pardon me. It's just not going to work. Because anything outside of love and compassion for the people that you go to church with and the people you live with, what the other side of that looks like it's called works. You're just working. You're just striving. You're just, just out there just striving, trying to make it happen, right? Well, you know, one of the things that I have fallen in love with as far as this church goes is that we have been a people, instead of going out and doing something and then asking God to bless it, we go and we look and see what God's doing and we bless it because if you're not doing what the Lord's involved in, that's called works. And you can enjoy that and it'll give you a little bit of spiritual satisfaction, but guess what? It burns away and you're wore out and disappointed, disillusioned because works will just wear you out. It just will. I don't care how strong you are in the Lord, how influential the Holy Spirit is in your life. If you're involved in works, you're just going to wear out and your fire begins to dwindle again. So we have the Word of God, which we have to stay in. You know, one of the things that I've that I did come away from cemetery with was you don't have to understand everything you read, guys. You don't have to understand everything you read. The Holy Spirit's the one that's going to give you the revelation about what you've read. So if you're thinking that your natural mind's going to comprehend it, maybe it will in, in, in some ways. But if you're looking for that spiritual, that deeper walk with the Lord, 
it's going to be the Holy Spirit that explains what you've been reading. All right? It just is. And there's a lot of folks that read the Word of God, and they go, I just don't get it. And, and I understand that. For sure, if you're over in Leviticus or Numbers or some of those books that just wear me out. I mean, I read that thing, and they go in, into these endless genealogies. Sweet, I know there's got to be some powerful spiritual value to the genealogies. I've just not figured out what it is yet. Praise God. But it's in there, so it's important. Just because we don't understand it doesn't mean that it's not important. So it is a heart thing, that, that, that heat that gets that fire going is, is a heart thing. If your heart has been filled with the word and you have love and you have compassion for people, you're on the way to building a hotter fire, a hotter fire. It's easy to grow cold. It's easy to grow cold. I've told you all this in the past, and I'll share it with you again. There are, there are times that I ask to preach on Wednesdays for one reason. It makes me get back in the Word. i got to get in the Word be able to preach. What are you saying? Yeah, that's what I'm saying. There are days that I get up and I don't open up the Bible and I don't read it. I've got other stuff that I need to get done. How do I know that I have other stuff to get done? Because my wife has left me a list of things that she wants me to get done. That's how I know that I've got things that I need to get done. Otherwise, I just kind of bum around the house and feed the horse and take the dog out and just have a great time. But my precious wife, gift of God, sees fit that she leaves me with a list. We've sort of had an uh, uh, issue sometimes because she'll come home and I've not done the list, and it turns out that she didn't leave it where I could find it. So, um, you know, that's, that is the truth. It's not like I found it and lost it, all right? No, no. But we finally figured out that for me to find it, I need to put it right by the back door, right? Praise God. That's also where I find a multitude of things that I was supposed to take with me, that I walked right past. There's my list. Here's the stuff I'm supposed to take. I get to where I'm going, and I wonder where it is, and then I remember that it's on the counter by the back door where we agreed it's going to be. The same way with, with the Lord. The Lord's got a list. It may be a list of things. It may be a list of people that he wants you to call or encourage. Or it may be a list of things that he would like to see you surrender to the Holy Spirit. And surrendering to the Holy Spirit is very critical. As the Lord's put it, to me more than once. Fred, if you could have changed it, you already would have. So it's evident that you're not able to get something changed or to have an understanding of what you're doing. Our reliance upon the Holy Spirit, guys, is, is it's critical. It's critical for us to sustain our relationship with Christ you know, some, uh, sometimes, depending upon the denomination that you come from, they either deny that he's of any value or they overemphasize. But here's, here's, the, here's the bottom line. We think the Holy Spirit is given to us so that we can utilize the gifts that he's given us or that we can minister better or whatever. That's... That's not his role, although it will be if you'll allow him. The Holy Spirit's given to us to give us revelation that Jesus is right there with you. 
without him, we don't recognize that he's in the room after they lead us in praise and worship. The promise is you praise and worship me and I'll inhabit the praises of my people and I'll show up. That's the promise. And you go, well, I, I just didn't feel his presence. Don't blame that on the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's ready to reveal Christ and what he wants to do in your life instantaneously, especially during praise and worship, because that's when he inhabits the praises of his people. So I, I, I encourage you, one of the things to keep the fire going is crank up the praise and worship at home, in the car, wherever you're going. Okay? Does that make sense? See, if you haven't noticed, things are getting crazy out there in the world. I mean, stupid crazy. Things going on that I would have never, never have, have, have thought about going on. And some of them, some of those activities, it's implied that it's God doing it. The only way you're going to know if, it, if it's the Lord doing it is, number one, if it lines up with the Bible, and number two, if the Holy Spirit gives you that revelation. If he doesn't give you that revelation, it's probably not God. I don't know if y'all have been paying attention, but one of the disturbing things that's going on is AI. You know, there, there's coming a day, and it very well may already be here, because I'm not tracking it that close, that you might see me preaching on Facebook, and it ain't me. They're able to capture what I look like. They're able to capture my voice. They're able to capture my mannerisms, how I move. I want you to think about that. That's why it's critical for y'all to get into a home group. If you're not in a home group, get into a home group. You can be ministered to there. You can be loved on there. The food's good. The desserts are awesome. You, you, you need to hook up. Seriously. Because there could become a day where they don't allow us to meet like this anymore. There, there could be. Well, there will be. I just don't know when. I just don't know when. The world's getting crazier, and that means we've got to get crazier for Jesus. We, we, we have got to get to a point to where we're wild-eyed for him to overcome the lies of the world because they are fervent. Hey, these, these folks are on fire. It's just a fire from hell, not a fire from heaven. And they are sincere about what they believe. And they're persuasive. And if you do not tag in, allow the Holy Spirit to speak to you and show you stuff, then you're going to be taken in. And then the road back is tough, especially if you're not fellowshipping with somebody. You got a fellowship, guys. Jonathan Hamilton, right over there, wherever he is, there he is. <coughs> There's not a day that goes by that I don't say, Jonathan, I read this, and this is how I interpret that. What do you think? And there are times that he'll say, Fred, what? Where did you get that? Or it's a revelation to him. But see, if you're not able to speak with, love on, and talk to folks about the Lord, you, you, you never know where you are. If you don't think the devil doesn't know what the Word says, you're naive. The devil probably knows the Word better than we do. He's able to trick us. How do we know that? first words he spoke to a human being, did God really say? Well, he knew what God said. And he tricked Eve. Okay, back to the fire. I'm not going to hold y'all long. I know that 
you're incredibly excited to get back in the heat. So let me get back here. So we have the fuel, which is the word of God. We have the heat, which is what builds up inside of you a love and a compassion for people. Well, I just don't feel comfortable prophesying or I don't feel comfortable witnessing. I get freaked out when you talk about the gas station and seeing somebody at the pump and the Lord saying pray for him and you're freaked out. I understand. I really do. But I want you to know that your witness Guys, it's a whole lot less of what you say more than what you're doing. If you're walking with the Lord, it'll be evident that you're walking with him and they'll be drawn to you. But if you're just speaking it, and don't get me wrong now, we have got to watch our words, right? Okay, we're not even going to go there tonight. We don't have the time. And I've forgotten that sermon. Not really, but we don't have the time. It, your witness is how you're living. If they see you loving on the wife, kids in good shape, you're doing what you're supposed to be doing. You're at church. Church attendance important? Yes. Sunday mornings? Yes. Wednesdays? Yes. That's where you get fed. That's where you get fed. That's where you get to witness to other believers that may have had your very experience and you didn't do very well, but they did great and they can share with you, well, hey, this is, this is what I experienced and this is what the Lord did in my life. That's important. I'm, I'm praying for the day that um, we can have more testimonies it's important for you guys, it's important for me to know that God's doing something. Because to hear the world tell it, he doesn't even exist. So we have this, this space here. And, and the reason why we have to have our fire so hot is that it will burn away all of the lies of the enemy and all the lies and the deception of the world. The last ingredient to have a fire really take off and burn hot is the oxygen. But that oxygen, Pete, she, she ain't going to burn, is she? No oxygen, no fire. You know what the oxygen is? It would be the Holy Spirit. Because the Holy Spirit then takes the Word of God, right? It's the fuel, the Word of God. He utilizes the heat, the love and compassion for people. And he takes that and he uses you in a powerful way because that flame, those embers have been fanned hot again. We gotta stay in that mindset. And I know that there's a lot of distractions in family issues in, in gosh, on and on. I, I pray that as we go along as a church that we'll recognize more and more of the presence of our Lord and we'll utilize that, that we'll seize that opportunity. Well, I kind of feel kind of, you know, seize an opportunity. Uh, kind of squeamish about that. Okay, well, I can tell you about four guys that saw an opportunity to have a brother healed and they ripped the roof off the building, off the house, and lowered him down in and amongst so that Jesus could touch him. That's loving compassion for your brother, for your sister. Well, I don't know what my gift is. Well, if 
find out. I can tell you what my gift is. It's not sharing. It's not preaching. My gift is prayer. I love to pray. I love to pray. I'm going to tell you tonight the secret of getting your prayers answered. Would you like to know what that secret is? Because I can tell you how to pray, how to start praying tonight and have your prayers answered. How, how many here would say, Brother Fred, I have prayed and, and, and I've not gotten an answer. Would, would anybody admit to that? Okay, we've got two telling the truth. The rest of you guys, you need to teach me on prayer. No, I'm, it's very simple. It's so simple that we miss it. Pray the word. Pray the Bible. Read the Bible, get it in your heart, and then when it comes time for you to pray over somebody, it just, it, it just flows. If you're in agreement with what the Word of God says and you pray over folks, that prayer will be answered. It's promised. He's listening. He's waiting for you to come into agreement. And it's in agreement the power's there. I have probably, when I say that my gift is prayer, that's not something that I came up with. That's something I was told. So if you're wondering what your gift is, if you'll start walking in what you perceive it to be, it'll be confirmed. It'll, it'll be confirmed. But I want y'all to know that if we were able to put up on the screen a list of all the prayers that I've prayed since I've gotten saved, those that were not answered would way outweigh those that were because it took me a while, years, to understand. You pray the word, it's going to work. You don't, it won't. Cut and dried. Oh, yeah, I've prayed some prayers and they've gotten a little bit of relief or whatever and what freaks me out elder steve is i've had folks come up on a sunday after sunday after sunday having me pray over them for the same thing and that gets my attention because one of two things either i'm not praying the word or they're not receiving it one of the two you got it Either I'm not praying what the Word says or they're not ready to receive what the Word is saying. So the Holy Spirit provides the oxygen to the fire. This is the only church that I've ever been involved in that recognized the young adults as the up and coming church. And that's what you guys are. I'm going to be dead and gone in 10, 15, 20 years, but you guys are going to be leading the church. And I'm, I'm very proud of uh, Pastor Shane has not only brought that to our attention as a church, but he has stood by it and he's fanned that flame. We got young adults that are our future elders, pastors, team leaders, and they've got the fire. And you know what? I'm not going to be left behind. Whatever price I've got to pay for him to fire me back up again, that's, that's the price I want to pray, pay. I'll say this, pray for my wife, because when I get fired up, she goes, ooh, and she goes along with me, and then she gets fired up. Hey, you want to see something really funny? A Baptist girl fired up in the Holy Ghost. Amen. I'm not kidding you. Now, we're not quite to the point that she knows what to do with it, but she can get fired up. 
I, I know that because she has become a great prayer warrior with me, and that's important. Well, everybody stand up. There you go. There you go. Stretch it out. There you go. Standing up. Good. Oh, yeah. Almost everybody. All right. Well, now that you're awake, you can sit back down again. Because this was just the introduction. Now we're going to get to the sermon, which is over here. And what the sermon's this, it's time to give it up. Time to give up all those things that we thought would bring us joy and peace and all that stuff. Go ahead now and make the decision to give it up. And the Holy Spirit will carry it away and he'll start prioritizing things for you. And he'll stir that fire up and you just don't want to be the ones to quench it. And he'll start real easy. The Holy Spirit's never going to have you do anything that would ever embarrass you or cause you to look stupid or cause you to say something stupid. That's not him. He's, he's, he's the one that was in the creative mode that got us created in the first place. We're his kids. We're God's kids. He's not going to embarrass you. Well, Elder Fred, I, I just don't know what to say. So I'm going to close with this story. This is a true story. Because sometimes I've told stories up here that weren't exactly true, but they made a point. This is a true story. See, I like to be transparent because that way when I leave the church, if you want to talk about me, fine. It was all true anyway. <coughs> um, I was my first pastorate. Now, I want to tell you all that I'm not a pastor. Uh, maybe a preacher. I don't, I'm, I'm not sure what that would be called. But anyway, they gave me a little Assembly of God church out here in Pottsboro, Texas. There wasn't anybody, I think I was like 24, 25, 26. There was no one in the church that was under 80. Okay, there was no one in the church under 80. Okay, and praise and worship was, there, there was Miss. Um, she had a strange name. Anyway, she was the piano player. And bless their hearts, they had a hymn book. I didn't even know that the Assemblies of God had hymn books. I just thought we went, you know, we just kind of flowed with it. But that wasn't true. We had hymn books. That wasn't what I was, you know, keyed in on. I kind of like to praise and worship where you dance and sing and hallelujah. Um, so I, I, I got kind of reestablished on, you know, onward Christian soldier. See, there's nobody in here old enough to know that song. So, oh, oh, one, one, way back there. Oh, two, three, okay. Well, anyway, Assembly of God and churches are normally they build the sanctuary and then they build the fellowship hall. And it's just one long building. And they have glass doors going into the fellowship hall. And what I'd have to do is I'd have to tell the older women, and that's kind of a broad statement because everybody was older, I had to tell this group what my final closing was so that they could go back and start bringing out the fried chicken and the mashed potatoes and, and, and all that stuff. And you're standing there looking at this through the glass doors back there. Praise God. So, you know, if you're not ready to wrap it up, you go ahead and wrap it up because you can see all of this food. Well, there was a tradition that you stand at the back of the church. Anybody going to a church like that, you have to stand at the back and shake everybody's hand, right? Praise God. So I'm standing back at the back of the church, shaking hands, and this man and wife and three or four kids come through there, and they are crying tears streaming down their face and said pastor fred i we haven't heard a salvation message like that the whole family wants to get saved again water baptized glory to god shake their hands i'm 
man. The only drawback to that particular thing was that I preached on tithing. <laughs> and the whole family got saved. Now, my point's this, and that happened three or four more times before I left that church. You know what the point was? The Lord's going to have them hear what they need to hear. So you don't have to worry about, well, what am I going to say? Don't worry about it. That's what the Bible says. Don't worry about what you're going to say because he's going to give you the words anyway. So don't quench the Holy Spirit when he leads you to do something, say something, love on some, someone. Don't quench the fire. And every time you're obedient, the fire gets a little hotter and it gets a little easier because you become less and less concerned about what are they going to think or what am I going to say or is it going to sound right. Forget it. He knows what they need. He'll have them hear what it is that they need to hear. Father, I thank you for tonight. I ask you, Lord, that your spirit would stir up, stir up a little flame in every one of us. Lord, if we've allowed that thing to kind of settle down into embers, we ask, Lord, that your spirit would begin as we read the word. He begins to fan those embers, sweet Jesus. And as the word changes our heart and we begin to find ourselves loving other people and having compassion for those that are struggling, let us be bold enough to step out and offer a prayer or offer an encouraging word. Lord, we really are, I feel like, in the end days here. We're in the end times, and things are getting crazy. And we need to be anchored in the word and the spirit of the Lord to cause us to be so red hot that the folks are drawn to us because the world's cold. And the church is warm with the, with the spirit of the Lord. I ask you to come and bless everybody tonight for having come and listened. In Jesus' name, let me pray the prayer blessing over you guys, and then we'll go home, I guess. It's number 6, 24 through 26, and it says, if you'll receive it, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you. And be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift you up in his countenance upon you and give you peace. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Thank you all for coming. Joey.